get it started, I think we have uh, each of the panelists uh, has uh, a background and a current professional career that involve innovation in government. And so we'll try and, and see if we can elicit some interesting responses. So uh, first thing I'd like to ask uh, Tom is maybe he can explain what's going on uh, in Yonkers and his role and um, how he thinks that what they're doing there can drive efficiencies for the citizens of Yonkers. And sure. then we'll move on. Be Thank happy you. to do that. And good morning, everyone. And maybe I'll just take a step back, though, before... Yeah, you know what? Why don't I ask each Yonkers. of you to say, say a few words that I might have left out that you might think have direct relevance to the topic here today. Um, if, if you want to answer that question, you can. If you want to hold it and let Kevin take over after a couple words, you can. Um, sure. So, okay. So, uh, so um, yeah, public-private partnerships is part of what we do at, uh, at KPMG. We're a, a financial advisor, strategic advisor to government and really do help them think through different ways to bring uh, innovative solutions to delivering uh, new pieces of infrastructure. Public-private partnerships is a term that does get used quite a lot. It does have a lot of different meanings to different people. And there's really just a spectrum uh, that P3s encompass, right? We heard earlier about you know privatization type transactions uh, from Mayor Williams. Um, that's probably the, that's the very right end of the transaction, monetizing an asset to an operating contract where there's really not a lot of risk transfer, but it's a broad spectrum, and there's a lot of different risks that can get transferred over the private sector. And, uh, and so as we talk through this today, you, I think you'll hear some different concepts around that. Uh, it's pretty clear our infrastructure is in bad shape. Every four years or so, the American <coughs> Society of Civil Engineers does a study uh, on the state of U.S. infrastructure. I think uh, last year it was actually got, uh, they got upgraded from D to D+. Plus. Uh, not a great report card. If you go through it, you can see it by sector, exactly how bad a job we do as a nation in maintaining our infrastructure. And, uh, and they estimate it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about $3 trillion to get up to a state of good repair. Uh, New York is not exempt from these same issues, and uh, I think we'll look forward to a good discussion on finding some innovative solutions to infrastructure. <clears throat> Kevin? Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, the LIA, uh, we've been around for about 90 years. Uh, for lack of a better word, we're sort of a Long Island's Chamber of Commerce. And uh, we're a not-for-profit, 501c6. We don't take any money from the government because we like to be able to criticize them and uh, when we have to. And uh, we're really an advocacy for growth, jobs, and economic development and uh, the, for the business community there. And why I share that and why I think that's important is because if you look what's happening throughout the country, uh, where states or cities are making some progress in reforming the way uh, the public sector carries out their business, um, in most cases, those reforms and those efforts are being led by the business community, you know, because uh, unfortunately a lot of elect elected officials and or legislative bodies, they're, um, it's tough for them to change or to make these decisions. So the business community gets involved either through gubernatorial task forces or on their own initiatives uh, to help come up with recommendations on what the public sector needs to do uh, to try to be a little bit more efficient like uh, many in the private sector are. And so that's why we get involved and that's why we chime in on these issues and look forward to answering some of the questions here today. Thank you, EJ. Um, I, I guess I'd like to begin by, uh, in, in the spirit of the conference today and, and addressing the, uh, the title of our panel, um, which talks about innovative uh, uh, solutions, I'd like to begin by, by strongly endorsing and putting forward something that is not would not at this point be an innovation, although it perhaps was seen as more of an innovation when it, it was imposed on, the on New York City as a condition for, for its bailout almost 40 years ago. But certainly now is an essential starting point for dealing with the problems of local governments uh, uh, throughout New York and in other states, and that is multi-year planning. Uh, to an amazing degree, there is a dearth of public um, systematic a uniform, comprehensive, multi-year planning on a local government level uh, in New York. Uh, in fact, even as we sit here today, only a handful of, of local governments in New York uh, not just maintain but publish multi-year financial plans. You can't begin to meaning, meaningfully get a grasp on the problems of local governments until you have a, a multi-year plan in hand. The irony is that many local governments and school districts, in fact, do engage in multi-year planning uh, as an internal planning mechanism, but do not share those plans with the public. 
And I think that we can't actually have a discussion of these issues in many cases until we have multi-year plans on the table. And I think that that has to frame every discussion we have of this issue. And it's, as one speaker this morning, I think it was Mr. Pollenkarts of, of Erie County actually said, I believe said it's high time that it be required of every local government. I think we've arrived at that point because uh, local governments continue to find reasons for resisting this, even those that actually do it as an internal mechanism. And I think it's really essential. Thank you, EJ. EJ, I'm just gonna take a quick survey of the group. What do you think is the single most significant problem facing New York State government? Um, I think the single most significant problem facing New York State government um, is an outmoded and inflexible um, uh, statutory framework for collective bargaining, which shapes the costs of, of primarily of local governments and school districts in particular. Um, that that um, makes it very, very difficult to change um, the, the, uh, the nat some of the basic elements and to restructure the basic elements of, of employee compensation and deployment from patterns that have, been, that have been set in place over decades. And that has to be dealt with in a number of ways and it needs to be confronted squarely. And uh, it's, it's a big problem for school districts and municipalities in particular because the bulk of their budgets are spent on personnel. They, they're people businesses. They deliver services to people with people. Kevin, what do you think is the single greatest problem? Well, it's a, you know, just a subset of what EJ said. I think it's um, the uh, long-term pension and health care cost for municipal employees and the retirees. It's just not sustainable. And, um, you know, whether it's uh, residential property taxpayers or the business community, uh, they're just not going to afford it. If we're going to try to be competitive um, uh, to attract growth and jobs, um, those two items are really are not sustainable and they need to be addressed. Yeah, no. Sound like a broken record, but certainly funding all the services that we do want to provide uh, as a state to our citizens, I think it is critical that we've just not got the right balance plan in place to really provide the adequate level of funding that's necessary. Mayor Williams. I, I would you say, you know, the uh, mayor or county executive is head of the public realm. And what do I mean by the public realm? So, you know, the founders set up our country based on a public realm as opposed to a private realm of a king or a queen. Okay, so you've got the public realm. Who's the head of the public realm? I guess it's got to be the mayor. And what does the public realm involve? It involves public services, public safety, public education, although I would use a broader kind of catchment for public education, include charter schools and school choice, but others wouldn't. So all these things are the public realm, and it's the mayor's job to lead this public realm. And the key tenements in my mind of the public realm are public accountability, which is why I wholeheartedly agree with you on multi-year financial planning. It's harder to play games. It's easier to have transparency if you have multi-year planning. Uh, another key thing in terms of public accountability is balancing leaving things better for the future than we found them. And therein lies a whole, you know, big uh, uh, argument and, and conflict between current services and retirees, right? You're basically kind of beggaring present, right? Uh, 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 future citizens for the benefit of present kind of services. And that goes to accountability. And the last thing I would say where the business community, I think, can play a critical role is, you know, governments like to do things, in a, and I say this as someone led a government, we like to do things kind of like in a command control way, thousand mile front, everybody stand by for the next 45 years and we'll get back to you kind of thing. Whereas I think what, where we can learn from business is to basically take things in a more catalytic, uh, take a more catalytic approach to change where one step of change leverages another step and another step. So think about it. When they launched, launched the Voyager, they didn't launch the Voyager and just power it all the way with an engine burning all the way through the solar system. No, they launched it. It bounced off the moon, bounced off Mars, bounced off Venus, bounced off this. And the thing's still going because they took a catalytic approach. So some of the best, I think, innovations in government at a local level uh, are being done in a transparent way, being involving business leadership and investment and doing things that involve transparency. Uh, I, I think of Boston and uh, Citizens Connect in Boston is a great example. You allow citizens to use an app, 
to call for service and it's open to all the world when I called, when I got my service, what the government did, right? That's a catalytic way of motivating the government to kind of promote better service and promote change. That was sponsored by, supported by business community. I think that's a preferable way than the way I used to do it and the way a lot of us think about doing it, which is to issue a decree, say we're gonna have better performance management, everyone will follow these rules and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting, you know? Take an innovative approach. Thank you. Um, EJ, the, the notion of taking an innovative approach that the mayor just described is one I think we're all, we're all seeking. It's one of, the, one of the things we're trying to do on this panel. But, but we still seem to, when faced with a problem here in New York, seem to think that some type of massive piece of legislation, particularly a new program, typically done about this time of year, uh, will solve the problem. Take, take economic development, for example. What do you think is the best way to uh, lead to economic development in the state? Well, um, the t what, what goes under the rubric of the two words economic development in New York State isn't necessarily equate to economic growth. But um, I think that in terms of economic growth, I think the most, the most important thing to do is to create a fundamentally improved uh, general macroeconomic climate in the state to make the state a, 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 more, a more congenial place uh, to organize, to start up, um, and to run a business, um, and uh, to succeed or to fail. And that to put as few obstacles in the way of that uh, as possible, and to learn from competitive pressures um, um, in deciding what aspects of our tax laws and regulations we need to reshape and, 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 and to make it a less expensive place to do business. Um, I think that's f fundamentally, it's, it's an expensive place to do business. It's too often a place that imposes a heavy hand of regulation as well as heavy taxes and that those things need to be addressed. And that unfortunately the worse the situation gets, and New York City for years epitomized this, the more oppressive your tax and regulatory climate the more sort of frenetic the efforts are in the legislature to create a, a, a um, wide variety of exceptions to those rules in order to entice people into a climate they wouldn't otherwise have anything to do with. And I think that when you see efforts such as so-called tax-free NY, which by the way is now known as another acronym, Startup NY, in the bill that they're about to pass, um, when you see this kind of elaborate um, legislative scheme for working around problematic tax burdens, that is basically a way of saying we have a problematic tax burden, we ought to do something about it in general. Um, and the one thing I, by the way, the one compliment I've had of that particular program is that it did refocus attention on, the, on general broad-based taxes as an issue because in Albany for over a decade the legislature and the succession of governors have been increasingly focused on delivering narrowly targeted tax reliefs to, to favored industry, which in the case of the legislature usually means whatever local buggy wit maker employs a lobbyist who used to work for you. Um, and I think now that this has actually turned the focus back to broad-based taxes and to a need for broad-based tax release, relief. That's the main criticism of Tax-Free New York. And that's what Tax-Free New York aims to deliver to a very narrow slice of people in very limited circumstances. Well, let me see. Uh, Kevin, you're at the forefront in a key area of the state with probably nearly 3 million people of uh, trying to help generate job growth and stimulate business uh, at the Long Island Association, the Economic Development Council, the Housing Partnership. What do you think of what, what EJ was just talking about? I don't disagree with him at all. I think, uh, one, I think Governor Cuomo should be commended for trying to do a lot of things in the economic development realm. And they're all, you know, uh, whether it's his economic development councils, his uh, tax-free New York, his, uh, his efforts to try to help upstate, I think they're all commendable. Uh, but the number one thing we could do is, you know, improve the tax and regulatory climate. And that then enhances a better business climate, and then that entails and enhances, you know, uh, the business community to want to invest and grow and create jobs. 
So uh, nothing against all the other programs, but the best focus would be on the tax and regulatory policy. I'm going to skip Tom because I want to go to you with the next topic. Uh, but I want to ask Mayor Williams, uh, you have a national perspective, and I realize you're not a, a full-time New York City resident, but what do you think about the, the general notion of what our two speakers just talked about? In terms of uh, the need for a better business climate? Sure. Absolutely. I think, you know, because even in my city, you see, sometimes you're working at cross purposes. I remember going out to try to bring better retailers. Now we're getting more, we're getting some of the best retailers now to come to the city. But I remember going out to this convention of shopping centers. When we started, they wouldn't even let us in the building, okay? <laughs> and begging these retailers to come to Washington, D.C. Now they're coming, and now we've decided in our infinite wisdom that we want a, a big business, special wage kind of imposition. So we look like fools. Well, here we are, we're inviting these businesses to come to the city, and now as your kind of in, you know, welcome uh, invitation, we're gonna slap you with a special kind of excise wage uh, imposition, which I think you know, you've gotta think of, I'll put it this way, there are things that only a city and a local community should do because they're competing kind of on a local, if not metro basis, but the state can do a tremendous amount to try to set Again, settled expectations for business. If I'm a business, I want to come into a community. I want to know that things are, at are, are going to be at least as good two months from now as they are today. Don't tell me that they're going to be great and then they're worse. Just leave them the same and then work to make them better. But don't, in my case in D.C., tell me to come to the city and then turn around and say, oh, I didn't tell you X, Y, Z. So I think what they're saying in terms of the state climate uh, and the government's attempt to try to improve that climate is absolutely right. Okay, now Tom, hold on, because I'm getting to your, I think I see a way we can segue. But so, EJ, you're uh, an Albany expert, so we need a, as Mayor Williams said, and as I think you and Kevin were discussing, without using the phrase, but a better business climate. So the session's ending up. So let me ask you, in the last two years, uh, think, let me think through what I think, uh, what I believe better business climate means. I think it goes to taxes and regulation to a great extent. Have, have the last two years of taxes in New York State gone up or down or stayed the same? Um, state taxes have basically stayed the same, uh, have basically stayed at a level, at, a, at, a, at the elevated level set in 2009 um, in the second to last year of Governor Patterson's tenure. The one positive um, step the state has taken uh, in the last two years, uh, last three years, if you go back to 20, uh, three sessions, if you go back to 2011, was the enactment of the cap on property tax levies uh, on local property taxes outside New York City, which to be sure really is, uh, makes a difference most substantially for the, um, to the greatest degree when it comes to school district taxes. I think that was an important step forward because, uh, among other things, that is a way of applying the brakes to broad-based property tax levies on all owners of all types. It was a departure from the recent Albany tradition of targeting some sort of break to people who you care about or who you hope to have care about you at election time. So it was not a targeted tax break only for homeowners or only for homeowners who had lived in a place for a certain number of years. That affects commercial property owners as well statewide. And so that was a very important step. I think that was a beneficial step. I think it will, over the long term, slow the growth in taxes. What has not happened is there is the delivery of, uh, on that subject that mayors and county executives talked about this morning, of mandate relief. And so an effort was made to limit the growth in local property taxes in New York State, which are very high. Uh, but nothing was done, nothing really has been done, in fact some things have been done in the opposite direction to give local mayors and uh, county executives the tools they need to be held accountable for managing to do better, to do more with less. And I'll close on one thing, what the legislature is just about to do is to pass a bill, it's actually as part of the so-called local government uh, financial restructuring bill, uh, that is supposed to change the, is supposed to address the issue of binding arbitration in New York, which, did, which has been shaping police and fire salaries for nearly 40 years, 
which has driven the, the, the cost of police and fire compensation through the roof in New York. There's absolutely no doubt about it. The law has been temporary and renewable every few years for decades. This was a chance for the governor to essentially dictate a complete fundamental reshaping of that law, and it hasn't happened. In fact, it was negotiated with unions, the teeth were pulled out of what reform he had proposed, and we've lost another opportunity to change that. So we took a step forward, and then we've probably taken a step or two backwards in the last couple of years when it comes to improving the broad business climate in the way I talked about it. All right, but we still have to deliver basic services, and um, we have to come up with ways uh, that are affordable and uh, a bit creative in which to do so. And that's where I think Tom and his expertise comes into play. So Tom, if you could discuss for a couple minutes your vision of perhaps, to, to use the overused word, innovative way of delivering services and how you, from your perspective and what you do professionally, um, sure. do that. And also please touch on what you're trying to do in Yonkers. Great, happy to do that. So. Uh, yeah, P threes again are a term that do get that does get used quite a lot. Um, but there are there are a lot of good innovative uh, delivery solutions and financing solutions that are available to governments for the right time. They're not going to replace the way things get done traditionally, but they're there as an additional tool to help supplement what's already out there for government. Uh, we do a lot of projects. Uh, we advise on a lot of projects that are new built, right? So I'm not talking about where we're trying to monetize an asset <coughs> to try to get a big lump of cash. We try to help our clients in many ways um, look at how do they develop or rehabilitate existing facilities in a way that drives down costs throughout its life cycle. And this goes to a lot of comments we heard today about long-term planning. We help our clients look at, Yonkers is one great, good example, but it, it's all over in a very similar fashion. You've got a facility now that's not meeting its needs, it's over capacity, it's uh, you know, uh, in, in, there's been a lot of deferred maintenance, and so you'd like to replace it and expand it. All right, so you want to potentially think about how do I incorporate the private sector in here to do maybe some of that, right? They can come in and maybe um, do the designing and building around the, the new facility itself. They can maybe finance the costs around constructing the facility and then operate it and maintain it for a period of 30 or 40 years. And so we help them think through how you can you know, use different pieces of that puzzle to structure the deal that's right for them, meets their goals and objectives. And so, uh, you know, one example is, is, is having that private sector do all of that work, design and build the facility, finance all the costs around it, and then operate it and maintain it. And we <coughs> basically have them compete vigorously for the right to do all that work. And by bringing all of the life cycle costs from from building it to the, the operating in major maintenance, repairing the roof, <coughs> uh, replacing the roof if needed, replacing a boiler over that period of time, pricing all of that today, work that could get done 30 years from now, getting that priced today, and transferring all the risk related to all those works over that long period of time, it's very powerful. And I think that's where a lot of people don't hear those benefits that P3s can bring. It's really, it isn't about monetizing assets, that's one, again, one element. It's, I, I feel more about how do we get the right parties at the table to do the right things that can do them best, right? Government still does a lot of things that they need to do best, and they need to stay on those tasks. Education is a great part of that. You know, dealing with environmental approvals uh, and trying to push those policies forward. Um, but when it comes to facilities, <coughs> operations and maintenance, and maybe construction, well, maybe those are good things for the private sector to take a look at. And if you can do that again in a competitive environment, you can bring down those costs, and we all know that you know we've been talking about you know fiscal issues here today. Trying to do more with less is obviously uh, I think an issue that would uh, sit well with a lot of folks in this room. So, so you you think we need some statutory amendments in order to do that? Or yeah, I think um, you know I, I think there's a lot of discussion out there. I know there's been a, there's been some draft legislation the past few years on on P3s, both. Uh, one was transportation focus, one was what we call social infrastructure focus, so schools, hospitals, et cetera. I think there's talk now about maybe a combined uh, piece of legislation that uh, folks will consider. So, uh, but I've also heard some folks talk that, you know, maybe an, an executive order alone can help drive some of this. And do we need sweeping legislation? Should we first do pilot projects? So there's a lot of talk about how to go about it. Uh, it, it is an issue, again, that's emotive and, and, and it gets a lot of people uh, Mayor Williams, sorry. is there, would you like no, to add I to that? I think the, uh, 
we, we're all talking about the century of cities and the rejuvenation of cities all over the country. You know, kids moving back to cities. Now these kids are moving back to cities. Are they coming back to the city going, God damn, I'm going back to X city because they got a really, I got a hell of a procurement system where I love their personnel system. No, they're going, no, they're going to the city because of the quality of life and the amenities of that city. And I think one of the things we have to do looking forward to cities, we have to understand what's really central to our identity as a city or mission as a city. And those things that are central, let's in, either ensure them or do them. And those things that aren't, let's figure out other ways to see that they happen. Because again, the reason why I'm going to invest in a city and come to a city doesn't mean that that city has to do everything the way, you know, your grandfather or grandmother as a mayor did. We need, to, we, we need to have a much more nuanced, sophisticated way of thinking about it, number one. Number two, if I were still running a city, I would say, okay, I've talked to my experts. They tell me, here are the efficiencies that we can realize, right, cost savings we can realize in our city. But I have to do them. I have to realize these cost savings in a politically defensible way. One way to think about it is, and this gets to my friend again in the mode of your financial plan. Hello, if you had a mode of your financial plan, you could say, okay, I'm gonna harvest X amount of savings, but in order to reduce my political costs, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna essentially manage attrition. So I'm gonna go to my unions, I'm gonna say, okay, uh, I figured out, okay, uh, there is a certain attrition rate in the city. Uh, I believe we can achieve certain economies in the city and I'm gonna basically replace attrition at a, on a one for three basis, and the unions will come back four for three, or no, I'm just kidding, three for three. So you settle on two for three, now you're ahead, and you've got a way to manage it over a longer term period. Now, a lot of people would say that's not aggressive enough, you need, you need to push harder, but compared to where we are in the public sector, I think that'd be a big advance, and you'd see a lot of gains, because, you know, again, you talk about New York City and the commuter tax, and I want to get in their business on whether they should have one or not, but it's easy to sit and kind of go, kind of fight old wars. In our city, it was commuter tax, and we found another way to do it, and it's been, and it's worked for us, because we took an innovative approach. Thank you. I can just pick up, sure. yeah, on the uh, sure. point of transparency and reporting is critical and really at the crux of trying to do any successful project using an innovative approach. People are going to question, well, why'd you choose this innovative approach and not do it the traditional way? And so uh, there's a concept that's been brought across the Atlantic uh, from Europe, primarily the UK. It's called a value for money analysis. Some of you may be familiar with this term. Uh, it's basically trying to do, if we look at this project over its lifespan, again, looking 30, 40 years out, and we were to finance it traditionally and operate it and maintain it traditionally, what is the cost of that over those three decades versus doing it um, as a public-private partnership? And, and what are the costs, you know, so you do get the benefit of retaining, of, of transferring a lot of risk doing the P3 and capping your exposure to cost overruns and, 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 uh, and, and other costs. Um, but there's some, ta some risks that do still remain with the public sector entity. So taking all these risk-adjusted costs into account for the two models, how do you then compare? How do you then make a choice? And, and we you know, work with our clients quite a lot on these value for money analyses because it becomes a, a very transparent process for how do, we, how do we make certain assumptions about risks? How do we make our decisions? How have we done stuff traditionally? How, do, how is this project gonna work out? You can test it repeatedly uh, for a single project uh, many times and continue to demonstrate why you've chosen a certain path, be it traditional or innovative. Uh, I'm gonna, so, look, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's it. Thank you. I, I'm gonna make one comment and then ask Kevin to, to comment on what's just been going on. But I, I agree with, with, with what Mayor Williams was just discussing, but just to relate it to a topic we talked about earlier, um, without jobs, without the economic growth that EJ talked about earlier, you're not gonna have people come into the city to discuss what services they want or don't want because they won't be here. They will be elsewhere. They will be in other states, they will be in other cities, they might even be in this world, other countries. So without the population, the discussion of the services will be in a downward spiral because you have shrinking population, the tax burden will fall on the fewer and fewer, and then the discussion gets goes in a way we don't want it to. But Kevin, I know that you're in the forefront of thinking about how the businesses can relate to government 
Do you have any comments you want to add to what the mayor and, and Tom were saying about this P3 or privatization or other ways to do things? Well, you know, we're very supportive of those efforts. You know, it makes sense. You know, we need to be doing things differently because the current way we're doing things is just not sustainable. And um, the governmental and political leaders are loath to consolidate um, and or merge. Um, and so by doing these public-private partnerships, it's probably the best we're going to be able to get. Um, I mean, some of you may recall, you know, two and a half years ago, uh, when the Suffolk County executive was cratering and the Suffolk County OTB was filing for bankruptcy and Nassau County was just taken over by a state control board. And I suggested, well, you know, if these are two private corporations right next to each other providing the same exact services in both hemorrhaging, they'd consider merging. Hello. Uh, but because they're governmental corporations, you know, it, it'll never happen. And unfortunately, 100 years ago, when three eastern town, western towns of Queens joined New York City and the three west, eastern towns of Queens became Nassau County at that time. They should have just become part of Suffolk County. We should have just had one county, but we had two. So that's not gonna happen. And uh, it's the current Suffolk County executive can't even merge two political offices, a uh, county treasurer and a county controller, uh, which is pretty unique in, the United, in New York State. Um, and so uh, those efforts are tough, and so by doing public-private partnerships, I think that you could build up more support for them and uh, hopefully achieve similar efficiencies as an outright consolidation or merger would. Well, we look forward to working with you on that, but I, there's there, um, one quick point. I mean, something I do professionally is we've tried to uh, help governments um, get out of certain uh, service providing that they don't really want to be doing and we try and do it in a different way we've tried to uh, take not-for-profits and bring them into water and wastewater there's uh, similar activities in um, the delivery of uh, electric power and there are other things it can be done with solid waste there, there, there are things that I've been trying to do as as a bond lawyer where I've been frustrated where, where we've been stymied so hopefully um, by political indecision or timidity. So hopefully uh, we can uh, actually accomplish what consultants and experts such as yourself and these panels are talking about. And um, you know, water, wastewater, electricity, solid waste, and other areas. I'm personally currently working on ideas and they're not being effectuated, not through lack of creativity or not through lack of a good way to do it but through timidity. So hopefully this economic necessity and, uh, will lead to the, uh, a little bit of bravery. Right, Jonathan, the, you know, the governor and right now with his, uh, the ultimate 3P, I think, is about to be voted on today or tomorrow, and that's the whole uh, uh, restructuring of LIPA. You know, you'll have a public, publicly owned uh, utility, uh, but it will be privately run uh, and managed by PSEG. I mean, you don't get a much more uh, blatant example of 3P than that. Uh, yeah, I don't know about about the, all the details of that, but I think you're right. That's a that's a, uh, a great direction in which to move. Now there are a few topics we touched on. We're running out of time, but I definitely want to hear from EJ for two things. First of all, if he wants to add to the last few minutes, but also I know there's one topic that's kind of page one news today in particular, not the one Kevin just mentioned, but but um, another bill coming out of Albany. If you want to comment on that and then we'll wrap up quickly. I know we're running out of time. Well, on the subject of, of, of public-private partnerships, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, ideally the point of having a public-private partnership is to bring in a private firm, the point of bringing in private industry and private firms, private finance and, and, and private companies uh, to work on projects for, uh, and to work on in infrastructure projects in particular um, is to build them more cost effectively and to operate them more efficiently and to share in some of the risk. Those are the points that are made. Um, there was another crucial element to this that's not mentioned enough, which is that at some point nobody takes on risk without being paid to do so. Um, and so we have two problems in New York State. We need, uh, we need to clear the way legislatively for P3s to happen. And I think the governor has attempted to do that, and I think more progress may be made in that front. But the thing we have not cleared up or clarified, in fact, we've moved backwards, is who pays for what? Uh, I would point out to you that the Thruway Authority, after being saddled with mounting debts for the, over the course of a, more than a decade by a series of governors, was basically uh, uh, looking toward a very substantial hole 
in its budget last year and needed to raise tolls. Um, uh, for political reasons, the Thruway Authority did not propose a toll increase on every driver, but only on commercial users, which would have been a very, very large toll increase for political reasons, because naturally small trucking companies and people in transport revolted against that. No toll increase was done. And so for the first time in 60 years, the Thruway Authority of the state of New York, an, an, an agency created to run on toll revenue and build with toll revenue, and sustain itself on toll revenue is getting a subsidy from the general fund of the New York State budget. That's moving in precisely the opposite direction of where you're going to. No P3 in the world is going to help you unless you've got a, a revenue flow. And the other problem is, alluding to what you talked about, Jonathan, is politicians go into P3s when somebody comes to them and says, I can monetize your revenue stream and give you $100 million up front or scale up or down the number uh, to whatever fits the locality. That's usually the wrong time and the wrong reason to do Wait, something. Wait, am I like the that. bond council on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, I, 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 and the problem is, um, again, politicians will do something if it seems to deliver a quick hit of money. But again, they're not focused on doing it better. They're doing on getting them on, on getting the money up front. They still don't want to be pinned down to what the revenue flow is. And even then, then they face the other problem that I just was talking about in the outset when you asked what's the biggest problem facing gov government. Quite often, there are people involved in running that facility at present who are members of labor unions um, and who don't want to give up um, you know, the jobs they have in running that facility. They either have to be grandfathered into it, bought off, or dealt with as they complain about uh, whatever's happening. There's always a, a interest blocks and groups politically at play in all of these issues that ultimately have to be dealt with. Yeah. And, and that's... Again, and, and uh, one final point, I mean, all of this ultimately is tied up in politics. There's no sort of pure, pristine, uh, you know, um, uh, laboratory in which these things are done the way we run. And uh, that, and, and ultimately, the, these leaders, political leaders, need to make hard decisions that will have consequences for them that somebody won't like in order to move ahead with some of these innovations. All right, well, look. I you know, as a former chairman of MAC, and we had that fun run criticizing the takeout of the MAC debt together, I definitely wanted to talk about the restructuring panel. I don't think we can get to it. Kevin, I wanted to talk more about consolidation. I don't think we can get to it. We, we haven't sat here quietly, but we're, we have a broad uh, discussion um, panel and series of topics. But I want to make one point, and I want to turn it over to Tom and then the mayor. Um, and then end with, with, with Kevin, I guess. Uh, there are ways to, you know, perfection, I guess, should be the goal, but it shouldn't get in the way of major improvement. And there, there are ways to provide some relief, some monetization, but create a new structure under which the governance will be better, under which tax-exempt financing can be maintained in order to use the cheapest source of capital for ongoing improvements. And I think there's uh, a way, particularly um, using some certain not-for-profits and other creative ways of finance, to capitalize on the private sector's ability to manage and operate, for example, water, as I touched on, with the public sector's need for oversight. And so I hope we don't get boxed into a, well, it's got to be either private or public. There are other hybrid types of ways. I've been spending a lot of time on it, and it's very frustrating that we haven't been um, a little more successful. Maybe perhaps some sunshine from panels such as this, even if one or two policymakers take it home. There are other ways to do things. But I, I'd like to move on because I know Tom wanted to yeah, jump just in, one thing. and I want to let, let the mayor, I think he might have wanted to as well. Sure. And, and so no, that's a great point too. There are a lot of options that are out there, be nonprofit structures or for-profit structures or traditional pure tax exempts. And that's the good news, right? There's a lot of options that are out there. But the one point, EJ, that I wanted to follow up on was, and, and you hit it right on the head, is you know, there is a distinct difference between funding and financing. And, and it, you know, in, in my mind, when you're looking at P3s to help finance and procure and deliver a project, that to me makes a lot of sense. When, when people do think though that I'm gonna fund some new project uh, through a P3, that, that is quite different. And it's one that should be thought about a lot before you really think through that because it's, it's actually really not the P3 that's funding anything. If it's a toll road, it's ultimately the tolls and it's the public sector paying the tolls. So even with P3s, funding is always really publicly funded and 
always publicly owned in my mind, the, the asset itself. And so it, I guess as people think through P3s, keep in mind P3s are really meant to be more of a delivery tool, a financing tool, help transfer risk. They're not a funding tool. But that was my last comment. Thank you, Mayor. I think to promote a lot of this, there's a lot of uh, mobilization of the public along ideological lines, you know, whatever our preferences. I think there needs to be more mobilization of the public just along getting stuff done on a local level line. You know, I remember my wife, if you asked her, she lived in St. Louis, you've asked her, uh, she wanted the best for her child, right? So she didn't send her child to the public school because the public schools weren't good. Now, if you asked her though, in St. Louis, you know, we're gonna close the school in your neighborhood, she'd be totally against it because it was a total async between what she thought was good for the neighborhood and what she thought was good for her child. This happens to our citizens a lot. You know, they're a complete async between they want the best service on a private level, individual basis, willing to make choices for that, but total different, in their opinion, conflict with what they want the government to do because they haven't really been educated. If you engage your citizens and you really educate your citizens and you call on them to do limited things, I can speak to this because I live this, they will follow you. But if you, your notion of engaging your citizens is like, you're going to them with a wine list in the restaurant and you're talking about the fine wine list and meanwhile the, re, you know, the re restaurant's burning, you know, they're not gonna take you seriously because you're not really engaging with them on a real practical <coughs> substantive basis. I believe if you engage your citizens on a, again, on strategic focused basis and you call on them to do things, they will come and they will step up and do what you ask for. And I think that's a hopeful sign. These things can happen. They are difficult, like my friend said, but they can be done. Thank you, Mayor. Now, Kevin, I didn't mean, I think, do you have any final or did you uh, say that? And then I'll wind up with EJ. Nope, I, I'm good. I just want to correct something I said before. I think I took an unfair shot at our president before. It was actually Speaker Boehner who proposed the elimination of uh, mortgage and state and local taxes. And I think the president was amenable to it, but I think it was the Speaker's proposal. So I stand corrected. I take back my offer to give you a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you just got a call from the president. Actually, it was both yes. of them. He checked his Blackberry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, I Thank didn't. you. No, I didn't. Right. Thanks. Okay. Well, the both tax right. reform and federal tax reform is very complicated. I think both parties and and uh, all all share some blame in it. EJ, would you like to uh, bring her home? Well, I mean, again, I would just I would just stress that there are there was talk during the different panels here about how you know we uh, uh, earlier on there was a lot of talk about how, for instance, financial control boards are not a solution, for example. And I sometimes think we use the wrong terminology for, to, to describe uh, what appropriate policy is. No, financial control boards, in the case of New York, are not a solution. They're a response. And they're an appropriate and necessary response to a situation where a government is on the verge of being insolvent, turns to the state, and says, we need a bailout in the form of authorization to borrow money. And, the, and the, the, they're an appropriate response because you should not give anybody a no-strings-attached authorization to borrow money to back out of their deficit. And then the second question always is, well, do financial control boards work, quote, unquote? Well, in the short term, they always work. They force politicians or provide politicians with a convenient foil for doing things they need to do that they hadn't been doing. Whether they have a lasting legacy that's positive really depends primarily on the politicians themselves, those who are there when, it's, when it happens and those who follow them. So ultimately, it's, it's elected leaders need to be, have the will to make decisions in all of these areas. But there are mechanisms that can be used productively um, to put nudge things back on the, on the right track or in the right direction. So I just wanted to make that point about the control board issue in particular. All right, thank you. So innovative legal and public policy solutions, I would have predicted we'd get into a discussion of the role of government and the role of leadership, and it did. It also touched on a bit of the micro inside baseball aspects, which are of necessity part of it because we're not just talking about perfect perfection. We're talking about reality of what's going on in New York. So with that, I'd like to thank the four panelists and I'd like to thank City and State. It's my understanding we're out of time, right? So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>